walang natira ni Jesus. Pag may natirang mitigating circumstance din. So, ganun lang kas kadali yung object niyo. No? So, if there is a combination of aggravating and mitigating circumstance, mag-view object mo muna. Pag may natirang aggravating, maximum period. Pag wala natirang medium period, pag may natirang mitigating circumstance, minimum period. So, ganun lang kasimple. So, okay na tayo sa general rule, na? No? Sa general rule, dalawa yung pinisider natin. Multiple aggravating circumstance, isa lang efekto, maximum period. Offset rule, i-offset mo muna. Tingnan mo kung ano yung remaining modified na. So, okay na tayo dyan. So, dito tayo sa exception. So, there are four exceptions. No? Number one. You have to be guided by Section 1 of Rule 138 because Rule 138 is one of the sources of legal ethics. Who may practice law? Ang sinasabi dyan ay any person heretofore duly admitted as a member of the bar or hereafter admitted as such in accordance with the provisions of this rule and who is in good and regular standing is entitled to practice law. Iyan po iyon. That is ULEP versus Legal Aid Clinic. ULEP versus Legal Aid Clinic. Okay? Yan yung doktrina. Alin yun, sir? Eh, yung any person. Kasi any person may mean na pwede palang mag-practice kung hindi yan natin makokorek, pwede palang mag-practice ang juridical person. So, let us disabuse... shares of XYZ, the 40% shares of XYZ, likewise owned by the same foreign corporation owned by foreigners that directly owns 40% of uh, ABC corporation. So to repeat, let's say the foreigners, right? The foreign held corporation owns 40,000 of 100,000. The same time, the foreign held corporation owns 40% of XYZ share in ABC Corporation. So the question now is, based on these figures, is ABC a Philippine national? Is it qualified to invest in public utility? Is it compliant with the Constitution? You have, of course, a reply. To make it simple, a reply is an answer to an answer. Ayan. And the purpose of the reply is to transverse new matters raised in the, in the answer. Transverse, dispute, di ba? contest, transverse, new matters raised in the answer. But even though you fail to find a reply, under the general under the new rules no if you fail to file a reply okay lang kasi exceptional situation lang ang rule na ngayon all new matters alleged in the answer are been controverted already so maski walang reply all matters raised in the answer are been controverted already if you talk
in relation to days in payment, the answer is yes, because the debtor would offer another thing. Uh, example, if the thing to be delivered is a sum of money like 20000 the debtor instead would offer his carabao in payment of his debt and therefore the consent of the creditors is absolutely necessary. Okay? He may not want the carabao. Okay? But uh, uh, in application of payments, is the consent of the creditor required? Definitely. There is no question he because he would accept. Okay? Uh, then there is consent. However, okay, the question that would uh, have to be answered is to which debt the payment should be applied. The third... Uh, Together we can. Walang natira din yung video. Pag may natira ng mitigating circumstance din. So, ganun lang kas kadali yung object din. No? So, if there is a combination of aggravating and mitigating circumstance, mag yung object mo muna. Pag may natira ng aggravating, maximum period. Pag wala na tira, medium period. Pag may natira ng mitigating circumstance, minimum period. So, gano'n lang kasimple. So, okay na tayo sa general rule, na? No? Sa general rule, dalawa yung consider natin. Multiple aggravating circumstance, isa lang efekto, maximum period. Offset rule, i-offset mo muna. Tingnan mo kung ano yung remaining modifying circumstance. So, okay na tayo dyan. So, dito tayo sa exception. So, there are four exceptions. No? Number one.
to our dear attendees from different parts of the country. I pray that you're all in a great state of health. This free webinar is streaming live via the Villales Law Center's YouTube channel and Facebook page. If you can hear my voice clearly, please type in the comment section, hashtag VLC. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Optimize this learning opportunity. Share this free online lecture to your friends and together learn at the comfort of your homes. I want to formally welcome you all to this free webinar. This is part of a series of free online lectures brought to you by the Virtual Law Companion of Villages Law Center. Allow me to share to you this good news. The Virtual Law Companion is the newest innovation of Villages Law Center which aims to provide an easy, convenient, and quality bar review experience. The Virtual Law Companion is a web application that is hosted on a dedicated cloud server. It can be accessed via the internet 24-7 for any web browser using any device or handheld computers like Android or iOS phones. Meaning, you can study anytime, anywhere, and from any mobile device. Please visit our website at www.biliazislawcenter.com to know more about our programs and activities. Before we formally start, please take note of some reminders. First, this free webinar is pre-recorded to ensure the uninterrupted streaming of lectures. Secondly, VLC team will be with you to assist you should you need more information about our program. Please visit and subscribe to our YouTube channel and Facebook page. Without further ado, please give your virtual class and welcome our lecturer today. Again, this free webinar is brought to you by our virtual law companion. Maraming salamat po. Together, we can make things happen. Together, we can. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. I will start my presentation with uh, what uh, Justice Wendell Holmes said many years ago, that there are three kinds of men, and I mean uh, women. Those who want to make things happen, those who watch things happen, and those who wonder what happened. And this uh, axiom was translated by our union president, uh, who was assigned at uh, the Pier area of Manila. Sabi niya, may tatlong uri ng tao sa mundo. Yung taong gusto ng pagbabago at panghawakan ang pagbabago ito. Yung pangalawang uri ng mga tao, yung mga taong nakatingin lamang sa mga pagbabago. At yung pangatlong uri ng mga tao, yung mga tao natulala sa mga pagbabago. I understand that you belong to the first group of people. That is the reason why you wanted to become lawyers. You are a person who want to make things happen and to, ha to make that change with a direction we will be confronting some issues and concerns on labor laws in this presentation. By the way, I am attorney Sally Matula, 
the president of the Federation of Free Workers and the chairperson of the Nagkaisa Labor Coalition. Uh, the Nagkaisa Labor Coalition is the biggest aggregation of trade unions in the Philippines today. I am also teaching in the College of Law of the Manuel L. Quezon University. Before I was also teaching labor law and constitutional law uh, at the University of Manila and at the University of Perpetual Health College. Let's now proceed to our main topic, labor laws and social legislation. My friends, uh, when we speak about labor law, we cannot skip uh, mentioning the labor code of the Philippines because most of our labor laws are found in the labor code of the Philippines. The labor code of the Philippines was adopted in 1974. It was signed into law by President Ferdinand Marcos through his exercise of his legislative power that is now known as uh, the Labor Code of the Philippines uh, or Presidential Decree Number 442. It is a compilation of about 16 laws including the hours of work, the payment of wages, the observance of the hours of work, uh, safety and health, and of course, uh, labor relations like the engagement and termination of workers as well as retirement laws. And as I said earlier, this is anchored on social justice. And social justice as defined by uh, Justice Laurel in Kalalang versus William is the humanization of laws and the equalization of social and economic forces by the state. It is the promotion of the welfare of all the people. And you can add more and it is exercised to the police power of the state under the principle of Salus Populi as Suprema Lex. The welfare of the people is the supreme law. As we understand it, uh, social legislation is broader than labor laws. But both are categories of uh, laws which uh, are intended to protect or to promote the welfare of society or segment of that society in the furtherance of social justice. And social legislation uh, includes labor law, agrarian reform law, social security law, and other welfare legislation. A uh, social justice principle of law outweigh or render inapplicable the civil law doctrine of unjust enrichment. So in case the doctrine of unjust enrichment will conflict with the social justice principle, Justice Carpio Morales said that social justice will outweigh the doctrine of unjust enrichment. And so in the case of Garcia and Dumago, versus the Philippine Airlines, the reinstatement wages of the workers was given uh, under the principle of social justice, despite the fact that the, the decision of the illegality of dismissal was reversed later on. So social justice where is heavier than the doctrine of unjust enrichment. And so that if there is a conflict, unjust enrichment doctrine shall yield 
to the principle of social justice. Labor laws can be classified into labor standards and labor relations. Uh, labor standards is understood as the minimum, the minimum standards of the terms and conditions of work that employees are entitled to as a matter of work. And the employers are obliged to give the same to their workers. And we can identify some of the minimum standards that the workers are entitled to. We can speak about minimum wages. We can speak about holiday pay, the overtime pay provisions of the labor code, the night shift differential, the service incentive leave, the uh, maternity uh, benefit, the paternity leave, what else, the parental, uh, uh, the solo parent, uh, parent uh, leave or benefits. We can speak about uh, the 13th month pay, uh, what else? You can speak about separation pay in case the worker is separated from work to, due to some authorized causes. So those are considered as minimum standards under the labor code. When an employer is contesting the decision of the regional director on uh, minimum wages or other minimum standards, the employer can compass the same before the Secretary of Labor by filing an uh, appeal within 10 days from receipt of the decision of the regional director. Of course, he should include a bank to guarantee the payment of the amount uh, awarded by the regional director and the failure to appeal within the 10-day period will make the decision of the regional director final and executory. This is in the case of Secretary of Labor versus candidates. In uh, labor standards, the burden of proof is on the part of the employer that he or she complied with labor standards. The worker need not litigate to get what is legally or what legally belongs to him or the whole enforcement machinery of the Department of Labor and Employment exists to ensure the expeditious delivery to the worker free of charge. And now let's go to labor relations. Labor relations uh, uh, can be defined as uh, those uh, part of uh, labor laws that uh, define the status, the rights and duties, as well as the institutional mechanism that govern the interaction uh, between the employer and the employees, or between the employer and employees represented. And when you look at the Labor Code, chapter or book one to book four can be considered as labor standards or uh, provisions of law, and book five to seven can be considered as labor relations law. Because of this international uh, labor organization, high-level tripartite mission, 
the bar examination might have some question on what is the international labor organization and how shall our courts or quasi-judicial bodies in the Philippines will uh, treat these international labor conventions like ILO Convention 87 on freedom of association and ILO Convention 98 on collective bargaining negotiation. What will be our answer? First, the International Labor Organization is the only tripartite United Nations agency which uh, aims to set uh, labor standards, develop uh, policies and uh, device programs promoting decent work for all women and men. The main objectives of the ILO are to promote rights at work, encourage decent employment opportunities, enhance social protection, and strengthen dialogue on work-related issues. The ILO brings together government, employers and workers representation of 187 member states it was established by the league of nations in 1919 or almost or more than 100 years ago so it is a tripartite body of the United Nations. In fact, the International Labor Organization is the only tripartite agency of the United Nations. All other agencies of the UN, they are composed of government only. But the ILO is composed of workers' representatives, employers' representatives, and government representatives. What is the ratio of representation? If there are two government representatives, there is one representative from the employer and one representative from the workers. Absence of any representative of these three social partners, the other partners cannot vote in the proceedings of the international labor organizations. Now let's go to the second one. How shall ILO conventions be treated? ILO conventions like ILO Convention 87, the right to self-organization, and ILO Convention 98 on the right to collective bargaining negotiation, they shall be treated with a force and effect of a domestic law. In the case of the Heritage Manila Hotel versus the National Union of Hotel and Restaurant and Allied Industries Workers, uh, which was uh, decided on January 12, 2011, the Supreme Court said that ILO Convention Number 87 uh, is treated with high respect and it was an ILO Convention 87 is considered as a binding law under this jurisdiction and we may quote again Father Joaquin Bernas who said that the Philippines recognizes that international law has the force and effect of domestic law under the incorporation clause of the 1987 Constitution, particularly Section 2 of Article 2. Thus, international conventions of international labor organizations, such as ILO Convention 87 and Convention Number 98, can be used by the parties like 
the labor code, the civil code, the penal code, and other acts of Congress in the settlement of disputes in quasi-judicial bodies or in regular courts. Remember that in labor relations, the principle of tripartism is a very important concept. So there might be a bar question on the issue. What is tripartism in the Philippine context or in the ILO? And another question, what are the tripartite bodies in the Philippines? And explain their functions under this jurisdiction. You might be asked probably to cite three or four or five tripartite bodies. What will be your answer? So on the first question, tripartism in the ILO and in labor relations in the Philippines uh, may be defined as the participation of workers and employers and of course in decision-making bodies which also the government is present and the labor code declares that tripartism in labor relations uh, as a state policy. Uh, the government uh, adopted tripartism as a state policy in accordance uh, with the provisions on shared responsibility and participation in decision making or called de determination. And it is cited, or they are cited in the fundamental law particularly in Section 3, Article 13 of the Constitution, uh, which is known as the Social Justice and Human Rights Provision of the 1987 Constitution. Tripartism in consonance with Article 290 before Article 275 of the Labor Code and as amended, ILO Convention number 144, a tripartite consultation to promote the implementation of international labor standards. And according to the recent uh, law, Republic Act number 10395, or otherwise known as an act strengthening tripartism in the Philippines. Through tripartism, social dialogue is enhanced. In this social dialogue mechanism, the three actors in industrial relations, workers and employers uh, and government uh, on their respective sides are representing the interests of these sectors, uh, the labor and the employee sectors and the government represented by the or represented the public sectors. Uh, this uh, representation hammer decisions to shape uh, labor, social, and economic policies and programs of the government. Uh, on the second one, tripartism is in practice in National Tripartite Industrial Peace Council uh, and in uh, a number of uh, industry tripartite bodies created under Republic Act 10395. The NTIPC, or the National Tripartite Industrial Peace Council, is an advisory body of the President and the House of Representatives and the Senate, and it is headed by the Secretary of Labor as chairperson. The Tripartite Industry Peace Council as the highest main tripartite consultative and advisory mechanism of the government. It functioned primarily as a forum 
for, for tripartite uh, advisement and consultation among organized workers and employers and government in the formulation and implementation of labor and employment policies. Also, TIPC is responsible for processing major issuances affecting labor, employment, and other related concerns, as well as uh, it can be considered as a clearinghouse for uh, uh, recommendation and ratification or denunciation of international labor organization conventions. Uh, the existing industrial sector and tripartite council, you have the automotive assembly industry tripartite council uh, for the automotive industry. Uh, you have the banking industry tripartite council for the banking industry. You have the construction industry tripartite council for the construction industry. You have the clothing and textile industry tripartite council for garments and textile. And uh, there's another one, hotel and restaurant tripartite uh, consultative body for services and restaurant and hotel. You have the sugar tripartite council. Uh, so there are a lot of them uh, at present. Likewise, there are tripartite bodies which are not only consultative but with authority to hear and decide cases and promulgate decisions and resolutions. You can adopt also rules and regulation with force and effect uh, like that of, of our laws. And, and their decisions and orders uh, they are obligatory. And like a, uh, a judicial body, we can exercise such a function. And we can identify the following government bodies as tripartite in composition with the uh, quasi judicial power. We, we have the eight tripartite divisions of the National Labor Relations Commission. So there are eight divisions in the NLRC, each division is composed of workers, employers, and government representatives. And the chairperson of each division is that government or public sector representative. We have also the Social Security Commission, uh, the commission uh, in charge for the governance of the social security system. And it also adjudicates dispute involving coverage and claims on social security. We have the Secretary of Finance as the chairperson, the Secretary of Labor and Employment, and the President of the and CEO of the Social Security System as uh, ex official members. So there are three from government, and uh, the law also provides that uh, there shall be three uh, representatives from the workers' group at least one is a woman and three representatives from the employers group at least one is a woman and another tripartite body we have the employees compensation commission and uh, this commission is in charge for work related claims and benefits composed also of the secretary of labor as the chairpersons and um, there are representatives from the workers and the employers and the public sector. And another tripartite body, we have the National Wages and Productivity Commission or the NWPC in charge for policy direction of the Regional Tripartite Wages and Productivity Board or RTWP, uh, RTW uh, uh, PB and um, in charge on wages and productivity and the regional tripartite wages and productivity board uh, is composed of uh, the regional director of the department of labor as chairperson you have the regional director of the dti and the regional director of the NEDA as members and uh, two representatives from the workers group and two representative from representatives from the employers group. So social partner, workers, employers, and government 
in uh, these uh, tripartite banks. In uh, the application of labor laws, in labor standards, and in labor relations, uh, these uh, are always anchored on employer employee relationship. If you remember recently, the Supreme Court promulgated a landmark decision in BT Ankin versus Lazaro case. Uh, the five motorcycle riders were hired by Lazada in 2016, uh, primarily tasked to pick up items uh, from uh, sealers and deliver them to the company warehouse, the company's warehouse with uh, 1,200 pesos each per day as service uh, fee. This was uh, mentioned in a contract entitled Independent Contractor Agreement in uh, 2017 or a year after they were hired. The five Lazada riders found out that they were terminated or they were removed from the usual routes and would no longer be given in these schedules, promoting them to file a complaint against uh, the company before the regional arbitration branch of the National Capital region of the NLRC for illegal dismissal. Uh, the labor arbiter, labor arbiter Samar, earlier dismissed the complaint on the ground that the five motorcycle uh, drivers were not the regular Lazada employee. This was upheld. Uh, the decision of dismissal by the labor arbiter was upheld by the National Labor Relations Commission on Appeal. And uh, when the workers filed a petition for certiorari under Rule 65 before the Court of Appeals, the Court of Appeals denied due course to their petition. However, when they went to the Supreme Court, the highest court of the land would rule otherwise. And recently, the second division of the Supreme Court, uh, and it was uh, Justice, uh, Senior Associate Justice Marvick Lunin, who granted the petition for review on certiorari five by the five uh, Lasaga delivery riders led by Christine Cabrera Dityanki. In uh, ruling in favor of the workers, the Supreme Court found that Lazada failed to discharge its burden of proving that the uh, motorcycle riders or the delivery riders were independent contractors rather than regular employees. Uh, using a two-third test, uh, the Supreme Court uh, uh, said that there is employer employee relationship between Lazada and the five uh, delivery riders. And uh, the Supreme Court used the fourfold test and the economic uh, dependence test. Uh, the Supreme Court said that all of the following. Factors were proven. Uh, first, employers, or it was Lazada, who select and engage the five motor delivery drivers. And it was Lazada who paid wages. And uh, it was also Lazada who was the power to dismiss and the power to control the employees conduct not only to the end result but as to the means. Uh, first, the workers 
were directly employed by Lazada, uh, shown by the contracts they signed. And uh, finally, Lazada had control over the means and methods of the performance of the work of the five delivery drivers as reflected in the way they carried out their work. Uh, Lazada required the accomplishment of a route sheet which uh, keep track of the arrival, departure, and uh, unloading time of the items. Uh, the riders risk a penalty of 500 pesos an item uh, when the same item uh, they would lost it on top of its actual value. The services performed by the workers were also proven integral or necessary and desirable to the usual business of Lazada with the delivery of items clearly integrated in the services offered by Lazada. And uh, the court also found out that the five were economically dependent on Lazada for their continued employment due to being directly hired. Uh, this after being previously engaged by a third party contractor. The Supreme Court said protection of the law afforded to labor precedes over the nomenclature and stipulation of the contract. And uh, the Supreme Court said in its decision on uh, September 21, 2022, but uh, just uh, released uh, recently, uh, expressly states that the lack of employer in employee relationship is on the shoulder of Lazada. Thus, the Supreme Court concluded it is patently er erroneous for the uh, labor tribunals, including the Court of Appeals, to reject an employer-employee relationship simply because the contract stipulates that this relationship does not exist. So that was the decision of the Supreme Court in D.T. Ankin versus Lazada. Earlier, the Supreme Court has also a similar points in a decision in, uh, in uh, a certain cooperative in uh, Davao City, uh, Isha Pru cooperative. Uh, that was a case on social security that the Supreme Court also invoked the fourfold test in determining employer employee relationship. That was the social security system versus issue of pro cooperative. The determination of employer employee relationship is also important in uh, being a member of a union. Before being eligible to be a member of a union, uh, a worker should show that uh, he is an employee of that certain company where the union is operating. So, employee-employee relationship is important in being qualified to be a member of a union. But uh, the qualification of being a member of the union, even on the first day, one can be eligible of membership to a union. So meaning if you are employed on the first day, even you are a provisionary, a contractual or casual employees, you are eligible to be a member of a union. Uh, let's go to another problem that might come up in the bar examination. For example, uh, is the government agency in engaging the services of 
uh, manpower agency liable for the obligation of the man manpower agency. So a question might be asked like the overseas welfare, the overseas workers welfare administration or OWA and now under the Department of Migrant Workers uh, engage the services of sparkling clean manpower for uh, uh, to provide uh, to provide janitorial services to its uh, head office in Manila. Uh, its services uh, its service contract was renewed every three months since uh, 2016. However, in the bidding held uh, sometime in uh, 2018. The manpower agency was disqualified and excluded. In 2017, three uh, janitors of the agency, formerly, formerly assigned at OWA, filed a complaint, complaint of, for underpayment of wages. And then both the manpower agency and OWA were implicated as respondents should uh, OWA, a government agency subject to budgetary appropriations from Congress, be held liable solidarily with the manpower agency for the payment of salary differential due to the complainants. And you cite the legal basis of your answer. Uh, the suggested answer may be OWA may be held solidarily liable with Sparkling Clean Manpower Services Incorporated under Article 109 of the Labor Code as amended. And I quote, every employee or indirect employee shall be held responsible with his contractor or subcontractor for any violation of any provisions of the code. When OWA entered into a contract with the manpower agency, said government agency lowered its immunity from suit. Uh, if OWA can be sued and directed to pay salary differentials to workers without budgetary appropriation, OWA can get the funds from the bank posted under Article 108 of the Labor Code. This statutory scheme of the Labor Code is designed to give the workers ample protection consonant with labor and social justice provisions of the 1987 Constitution. This uh, is based on the decision of the Supreme Court in the case of GSIS versus the National Labor Relations Commission uh, promulgated on November 17, 2010. So now you pass the 2023 bar examinations and you are hired by a multinational pharmaceutical company as its legal counsel. Its uh, sales manager Diana died due to COVID-19 infection. She died without receiving her last month's salary of 5 million pesos. Her husband Carlo and daughter Irene are the only heirs of Diana. Carlo wrote a letter to the company claiming the last salary of Diana. As counsel of the company, the human resource manager asked your advice whether there is a need for an interstate proceedings before the company will release your uh, will, will release a said claim to Carlo 
and his family. What will be your advice to the human resource manager? Uh, explain briefly. So you are a new lawyer. What will be your answer? Of course, you just remember the provision of the labor code. No, there is no need for an interstate proceeding. And uh, you will tell the human resource manager just to follow Article 105, Paragraph B of the Labor Code, which states, among others, uh, and I quote, B, where the worker has died, in which case the employer may pay the wages of the deceased worker to the ears of the latter without the necessity of interstate proceedings, and quote. So it's a provision of the labor code. So you will just require what? The claimants, if they are all of age, to execute an affidavit attesting to their relationship to the deceased person and uh, the fact that they are uh, her ears uh, to the exclusion of all other persons. Uh, if any of the ears is a minor, the affidavit shall be executed on his or her behalf by his or her natural guardian or next of kin. The affidavit shall be presented to the employer who shall make payment through the Secretary of Labor and Employment or his or her representative. The representative of the Secretary of Labor and Employment, usually the director of the regional director of the DOLI, shall act as referee in dividing the amount paid among the A's. The payment of wages following the foregoing article shall absolve the employer of any further liability with respect to the amount paid to the ears of the worker. So, of course, uh, uh, you have to ask the, the family or the husband to show the marriage contract, the children, the birth certificate. So you just follow Article 105 and you are safe in paying the claims and benefits of the ears of a person who died. Of course, we go to some issue uh, on Kasambahay or these household workers. In an action for habeas corpus, filed by Bert or Lomi in behalf of his cousin Lisa Flores, who was employed as domestic worker by an employment agency owned by Sally Azar, a cash deployment payment of 5,000 pesos considered as loan had been advanced to Lisa by the agency. However, uh, Lisa wanted to transfer to another employer, which the agency disallowed because of her unpaid loan. You are the judge. Decide whether the agency has the right to restrain her movement since said domestic worker was not yet able to pay or return the cash advance the employer earlier gave to Lisa. Explain briefly. So as a judge, the answer is, I will grant the petition for habeas corpus. I will rule that an employment agency regardless of the amount it may advance to prospective employee or house helper, has absolutely no power to curtail 
your freedom of movement. In the case of Kaunka versus Salazar, 82 Philippines uh, 851, the Supreme Court said that in the scale of values, there is no acceptable equivalence between matters involving human dignity and those belonging to the domain of business. The latter are characterized by transience and precariousness, while the former are the nearest things to what are everlasting. If ever there are any in humanity, human dignity and human freedom are essentially spiritual, notwithstanding their material manifestations in the external world. And the universal concept of the spirit is inseparable inseparable from the idea of the eternal, of the unlimited space or time. Employment expenses mentioned in the uh, transporting household helpers from their respective provinces to home of employer can be considered as deployment expenses under Republic Act 10361, otherwise known as the Domestic Workers Act or Batas Kasambahay. The law defines deployment expenses as expenses that are directly used for the transfer of the Kasambahay from place of origin to the place of war, covering the cost of transportation, transportation meals, communication expenses, and other incidental expenses. Uh, rule 1, Section 3C, Implementing Rules and Regulation of the Batas Kasambahay. Considering this provision of the law and the rules, the expenses incurred for the hiring of Kasambahay that includes expenses for their transportation food and other related expenses fall under the above mentioned definition of deployment expenses. And with regard to the charging of deployment expenses of Bakasambahay, the law is clear. The law has expressed provisions regarding this concern as follows. Section 3, deployment expenses, the employer whether the Kasambahay is directly or through an employment agency shall pay the expenses directly used for his, his or her transfer from the place of origin to the place of work. So you have to consider that in the siding, in the decision of that particular case. Now, let's go to some questions on social legislation. So, in particular, the social security system law. Uh, the problem is uh, the commissioners of the social security system and the executives of the SSS were given huge uh, bonuses amounting to millions of pesos uh, for the last few years. Uh, they advised the president to veto the 5,000 pension hike bill approved by Congress. As a sign of protest, Pinoy militant enterprises and employer refused to remit the social security contribution of its employees and instead give the employers the employer share of the contribution to uh, the 500 employees to augment their uh, income the sss found out later on 
there's a huge amount of unremitted uh, social security contribution. The Pinoy Militant Enterprises was assisted by the SSS on the unremitted contributions uh, plus interest and penalties. The employer invoked the defense that it already gave the funds directly to the SSS members who are employee of the Pinoy Militant Enterprises for their immediate enjoyment. Is the employer no longer liable to remit the monthly contributions to the SSS? Is the SSS correct in directing the employer to pay the unlimited amount plus interest and penalties as part of fact that these unlimited contributions were already distributed directly to the employees of Pinoy Militant Enterprises? Explain your answer. So the answer is the employer is still obliged to remit the monthly contribution as the same is mandatorily required by law, despite the fact that the employer had already distributed this unremitted uh, contribution to uh, its employees. The protest does not excuse uh, the employer from the SSS compulsory coverage and compulsory remittance of the contribution under Republic Act 11199. The SSS, of course, can compel Pinoy militant enterprises to remit the required contribution with penalty and interest and the employer might also be liable for imprisonment if the employer will not uh, remit the demanded uh, contributions. Another question and answer on social security system benefits with respect to survivorship pension. This is a true story but I just put it in a problem and uh, solution uh, form. Uh, Boni or Bonifacio, 60 years of age, retired from a government uh, corporation incorporated under the uh, corporation code. After retirement, Boni married his long-time live-in partner, Evelyn. Five months thereafter, he died. They have five children who are all adults and live separately from them. Evelyn, after receiving the SSS funeral benefit of 20,000 pesos, filed a claim for survivorship pension a monthly pension as a widow of Boni. The social security system denied the survivorship claim of Evelyn. In denying Evelyn's claim, SSS invoked Section 12, Paragraph B, uh, subparagraph B of Republic Act 11199 which states that, uh, paragraph B, upon the death of the retired member, his primary beneficiary, as of the date of retirement, shall be entitled to receive the monthly pension, end quote. Evelyn was not yet married to Bonifacio at the date of his retirement, thus, the social security system argued Evelyn is not qualified benef primary beneficiary as she married Bonifacio only after the date of contingency 
of retirement. Now, Evelyn went to your office for legal assistance. What shall be your advice to him to be entitled to her survivorship pension? You have to write an advisory letter for Evelyn. So what is your letter? You may drop, Dear Evelyn, I received your uh, the issue and concerns you presented. This is in connection with your request for legal assistance on the denial of your survivorship claim by SSS under Section 12B, uh, uh, so Paragraph D of Republic Act uh, 11199, which states that, uh, I quote, uh, the, <clears throat> upon the death of the retired member, the, his primary beneficiary as of the date of retirement shall be entitled to receive the monthly pension. You were not yet married to Bonifacio at the date of his retirement, thus the SSS argued you're not qualified primary beneficiary as you're married to Bonifacio only after the date of contingency of retirement. Please be informed that the Supreme Court had already declared uh, the above quoted provision of the SS law as unconstitutional in the case of the CAIFO versus the SSS on November 30, 2007. And uh, the Supreme Court said that this uh, provision of the SSS law violated the due process and equal protection clauses of the fundamental law. You were deprived of your vested right to succeed to the social insurance of your husband by virtue only of having married to him after retirement. Such is also discriminatory as it distinguishes marriages before and after retirement when there is no such valid basis. Marriages uh, before and marriages after shall be treated equally without discrimination. Considering that the SSS had already denied your claim, the remedy is to file a complaint or petition against uh, petition against the SSS uh, before the Social Security Commission, which will adjudicate your claim. Thank you. I'm one retired. That's your letter to Evelyn so that you can give solution to her problem. So we go now to an issue of an overseas contract worker. Uh, you are a new lawyer, you went to your province, a neighbor asked you for some legal assistance, uh, she has two dependent children studying in a Catholic school in the town center of your place. Her husband, Mario Malandi, is a uh, seafarers on board ocean going in the universal emotion. Before Mario boarded his prison, he told his mining agency, the Virgin Mining Corporation, to stop his uh, remittance to his wife because of her alleged infidelity. For three months now, she did not receive her regular 80,000 
monthly allotment from the foreign earnings of her husband, which she and her children used to enjoy for the past 10 years. What are you going to advise her to address her legal concern in order to get support from her husband? The proposed answer is that I will tell you to send a demand letter to the Virgin Money Agency and uh, another one to her husband asking them the remittance of uh, the allotment for her and her children's support. Under Article 22 of the Labor Code, it shall be mandatory for all Filipino workers abroad to remit a portion of their foreign exchange earnings to their families, dependents, and or beneficiaries in the Philippines in accordance with rules and regulations prescribed by the Secretary of Labor and Employment. The failure to remit of foreign earnings or foreign exchange earnings on the part of the agency is a prohibited act and it can be considered as a ground for cancellation of its license or authority under Article 34 of the Labor Code. On the part of the husband, the husband or the officers of the agency may be also liable for violation of Republic Act 9262, otherwise known as the Anti-Violence Act Against Women and Children. The non-remittance uh, under this act may be considered as economic violence against women and children. Remember that. This, uh, another question, on offices, Filipino workers, and the protection of our workers outside the country under Article 21 of the Labor Code. Because you are part of the campaign of President Bongbong Marcos in the May 2022 elections, you are you were appointed by the Secretary of the Department of Migrant Workers as a labor attaché of Hong Kong. The Secretary of Migrant Workers did not give you any instruction before you left Manila. What are you going to do in Hong Kong as a foreign service representative of the Department of Migrant Workers. Explain your answer. So the answer is found in Article 21 of the Labor Code. The suggested answer, I will do the following even without prior instruction or advice from the Home Office. Under Article 21 of the Labor Code, the Foreign Service representative has the following function. A. To provide all Filipino workers within jurisdiction assistance on all matters arising out of employment. B. To ensure that Filipino workers are not exploited or discriminated against. C. To verify and certify as requisite to authentication that the terms and conditions of employment in contracts involving Filipino workers are in accordance with the Labor Code and the rules and regulations of the Overseas 
Employment Development Board and the National Seamen Board. D, to make continuing studies or results and recommendations on the various aspects of the employment market within their jurisdiction, in this particular case in Hong Kong. E, to gather and analyze information on the employment situation and its probable trends to make such information available to the Department of Migrant Workers and the Department of Foreign Affairs and F to perform such other duties as may be required of them from time to time. So let's go now to termination, illegal termination of employment uh, in all bar examinations the issue of the legality or illegality of dismissal is always a part of the examination. Remember that? So I'll tell you about the story of a professor who was illegally dismissed. Professor Bombastic was a faculty member of a certain college in the South. On, on July 21, 2007, while uh, uncle, this is uncle, was numbering the lockers in accordance with the policy implemented by Dr. John, who was then in a conversation with Professor Bombastic, asked, uh, Bombastic asked Uncle as to what he was doing. Mrs. Uncle later then replied that she is, she was reassigning the lockers of the faculty members to drawing of lots. Uh, Dr. John then commented that para naman tayong bata niyan. To which Professor Bombastic chimped in a loud voice, oo nga naman para tayong mga grade 1 niyan. Anong kabubuhan ng grade 1 niyan? Dr. Tililing confronted Bombastic on his remark that resulted into a heated conversation. Dr. Or Professor Bombastic woke out while Dr. Tililing was still talking to him. An administrative investigation followed and the committee found Professor Bombastic guilty of serious misconduct for having uttered derogatory remarks to his superior. Instead of dismissing Professor Bombastic, the committee take into consideration that it was uh, Professor Bombastic's first offense and stressed on the reformative and redempted uh, nature of the case. Professor Bombastic was only uh, meted with penalty of suspension without pay for a period of two months and uh, he was directed to submit a written public apology to Dr. Tiridin, his superior. In a letter dated July 29, 2007, uh, Professor Bombastic sought reconsideration of his suspension. He explained that a written public uh, apology was also inappropriate at that time 
in view of the pendency of a criminal complaint for grave oral defamation filed by Dr. Pinili. Professor Bombastic uh, requested or Professor Bombastic's uh, request for reconsideration was denied, which prompted uh, uh, Professor Bombastic to file a complaint for illegal suspension and unfair labor practice act before the regional arbitration branch of the NLRC. During the pendency of the case before the NLRC, the committee again demanded from Professor Bombastic his written public apology, which Bombastic refused to issue. Hence, he was dismissed from employment for insubordination. Now, the side on Professor Bombastic's dismissal from employment. What is the ruling? So if you will be asked, uh, Professor Bombastic's dismissal from employment is unlawful and illegal. In the case of Joel Montaliana versus La Consolacion College, which was decided on December 8, 2014, the Supreme Court uh, reversed the decision of the Court of Appeals and reinstated the decision rendered by the National Labor Relations Commission uh, affirming the uh, decision of the labor arbiter uh, which found Montaliana's illegal dismissal. Uh, the Supreme Court stresses that the employer bears the burden of proving through substantial evidence that uh, the just or any other authorized cause for uh, dismissal uh, is proven uh, with substantial evidence, failing in which the dismissal should be adjudicated as illegal. In the case of Professor Bombastic, the school failed to prove by substantial evidence that uh, the employee, uh, the employee's non-compliance with the directive to apologize was willful or intentional. In the case of Montaliana, the Supreme Court agreed with the NLRC that Disobedience attributed to Montaliana could not be justly characterized as willful within the contemplation of Article 296 of the Labor Code. The Supreme Court added that in, it would uh, incriminate Professor uh, Montaliana in the criminal case for grave oral defamation. And upon the advice of his own lawyer, Montaliana exhibited good faith in dealing with the employer. This, therefore, uh, negates the theory that Montaliana's failure to abide by the employer's directive to apologize was attended by a wrong and perverse mental attitude rendering the employees act inconsistent with proper subordination, which would warrant his termination. The Supreme Court further added that even on the assumption that there was willful disobedience, still the court finds the penalty of dismissal too harsh a penalty. Uh, it appears to stress that not every case of insubordination or willful disobedience by an employee reasonably deserves the penalty of dismissal. The penalty to be imposed on an erring employee must be commensurate with the gravity of his offense.
to the Supreme Court's mind the case of an employee who is compelled to apologize for a previous infraction but fails to do so is not one which will properly warrant his termination absent any proof that the refusal was made in brazen disrespect of his employer. While there is no question according to the Supreme Court that uh, teachers are held to a peculiar standard of behavior in view of their significant role in the rearing of our youth, educational institutions are in the meantime held uh, against a legal standard imposed against all employers, among which is the reservation of the ultimate penalty of dismissal for serious infraction enumerated as just causes under Article 296 of the Labor Code. In this particular case, unfortunately, respondents uh, in this particular case failed to prove the seriousness of Montiliana's omission by evidentiary ben benchmark of substantial so in this particular case, the refusal of Montaliana to obey the uh, directive of the employer to submit a public apology was considered by, by the Supreme Court as justifiable because such submission will result to an um, incrimination in a criminal uh, complaint. Montaliana was reinstated back to work due to the illegal termination of his employment. Now we are going to the end of our presentation. I hope that you enjoy my lecture. Uh, there is a need to have uh, an open forum, but I think the Facebook will not allow us at the moment. Uh, it's only given one hour to present labor laws and social legislation. And so I come to the end. But remember what Oak Mandino said. I memorized this one when I took the bar exam in 1997. I became a lawyer in 1998. Ogman said, if your determination to succeed is strong enough, failure will not overcome you. Thank you. Enjoy. Good luck. Mabuhay po kayo. Walang natira ni Diyo dito. Pag may natira ng mitigating circumstance dito, so ganun lang kasikandali yung object dito. No? So if there is a combination of aggravating and mitigating circumstance, mag yung object mo muna. Pag may natira ng aggravating, maximum period. Pag wala natira ng medium period, pag may natira ng mitigating circumstance, minimum period. So ganun lang kasimple. So okay na tayo sa general rule, na? No? Sa general rule, dalawa yung pinipider natin. Multiple aggravating circumstance, isa lang yung efekto, maximum period. Offset rule, i-offset mo muna. Tingnan mo kung ano yung remaining modified na. So, okay na tayo dyan. So, dito tayo sa exception. So, there are four exceptions. No? Number one.
Of course, my friends, you have, of course, a reply. To make it simple, a reply is an answer to an answer. Ayan. And the purpose of the reply is to transverse new matters raised in the, in the answer. Transverse, dispute, di ba? contest, transverse, new matters raised in the answer. But even though you fail to find a reply under the general under the new rules, no? If you fail to find a reply, okay lang. Kasi exceptional situation lang. Ang rule na ngayon, all new matters alleged in the answer are been controverted already. So maski walang reply, all matters raised in the answer are been controverted already. If you talk In relation to decision in payment, the answer is yes, because the debtor would offer another thing. Uh, example, if the thing to be delivered is a sum of money like 20000 the debtor instead would offer his carabao in payment of his debt and therefore the consent of the creditors is absolutely necessary. Okay? He may not want the carabao. Okay? But uh, uh, in application of payments, is the consent of the creditor required? Definitely. There is no question he, because he would accept. Okay? Uh, then there is consent. However, okay, the question that would uh, have to be answered is to which debt the payment should be applied. The third... Uh, Together we can. So if there is a combination of aggravating and mitigating circumstances, mag you object mo muna. Pag may natirang aggravating, maximum period. Pag wala natirang medium period, pag may natirang mitigating circumstances, minimum period. So gano'n lang kasimple. So okay na tayo sa general rule, na? No? Sa general rule, dalawa yung pinisider natin. Multiple aggravating circumstances, isa lang efekto, maximum period. Offset rule, i-offset mo muna. Tingnan mo kung ano yung remaining modified na. So, okay na tayo dyan. So, dito tayo sa exception. So, there are four exceptions. No? Number one, So, of course, my friends, 
you have, of course, a reply. To make it simple, a reply is an answer to an answer. Ayan. And the purpose of the reply is to transverse new matters raised in the, in the answer. Transverse, dispute, di ba? contest, transverse, new matters raised in the answer. But even though you fail to find a reply, under the general under the new rules no if you fail to file a reply okay lang kasi exceptional situation lang ang rule na ngayon all new matters alleged in the answer are been controverted already so maski walang reply all matters raised in the answer are been controverted already if you talk In relation to addition in payment, the answer is yes, because the debtor would offer another thing. Uh, example, if the thing to be delivered is a sum of money like 20000 the debtor instead would offer his carabao in payment of his debt, and therefore the consent of the creditors is absolutely necessary. Okay? He may not want the carabao. Okay? But uh, uh, in application of payments, is the consent of the creditor required? Definitely, there is no question he because he would accept. Okay, uh, then there is consent. However, okay, the question that would uh, have to be answered is to which debt the payment should be applied. The third. Uh, Together we can. Together we can. Walang natira dito dito. Pag may natira ng mitigating circumstance dito. So, ganun lang kas kandali yung offset dito. No? So, if there is a combination of aggravating and mitigating circumstance, mag yung offset mo muna. Pag may natira ng aggravating, maximum period. Pag wala na tira, medium period. Pag may na tira ng mitigating circumstance, minimum period. So, gano'n lang kasimple. So, okay na tayo sa general rule, na? No? Sa general rule, dalawa yung consider natin. Multiple aggravating circumstance, isa lang efekto, maximum period. Offset rule, i-offset mo muna. Tingnan mo kung ano yung remaining modifying circumstance. So, okay na tayo dyan. So, dito tayo sa exception. So, there are four exceptions. No? Number one.
So, of course, my friends, you have, of course, a reply. To make it simple, a reply is an answer to an answer. Ayan. And the purpose of the reply is to transverse new matters raised in the, in the answer. Transverse, dispute, di ba? contest, transverse, new matters raised in the answer. But even though you fail to find a reply under the general, under the new rules, no? If you fail to find a reply, okay lang. Kasi exceptional situation lang. Ang rule na ngayon, all new matters alleged in the answer are been controverted already. So, maski walang reply, all matters raised in the answer are been controverted already. If you talk In relation to decision in payment, the answer is yes, because the debtor would offer another thing. Uh, example, if the thing to be delivered is a sum of money like 20000 the debtor instead would offer his carabao in payment of his debt and therefore the consent of the creditors is absolutely necessary. Okay? He may not want the carabao. Okay? But uh, uh, in application of payments, is the consent of the creditor required? Definitely, there is no question he because he would accept. Okay, uh, then there is consent. However, okay, the question that would uh, have to be answered is to which debt the payment should be applied. The third. Uh, Together we can. Together we can. Walang natira video video. Pag may natira ng mitigated circumstances din. So kano lang kas kadali yung object niyo, no? So if there is a combination of aggravating and mitigating circumstances, mag yu object mo muna. Pag may natira ng aggravating maximum period. Pag wala na tira, medium period. Pag may natira ng mitigating circumstance, minimum period. So, gano'n lang kasimple. So, okay na tayo sa general rule, ha? Sa general rule, dalawa yung pinipider natin. Multiple aggravating circumstance, isa lang yung efekto, maximum period. Offset rule, i-offset mo muna. Tingnan mo kung ano yung remaining modifying circumstance. So, okay na tayo dyan. So, dito tayo sa exception. So, there are four exceptions. Ha? Number one. So, 
Of course, my friends, you have, of course, a reply. To make it simple, a reply is an answer to an answer. Ayan. And the purpose of the reply is to transverse new matters raised in the, in the answer. Transverse, dispute, di ba? contest, transverse, new matters raised in the answer. But even though you fail to find a reply under the general, under the new rules, no? If you fail to find a reply, okay lang. Kasi exceptional situation lang. Ang rule na ngayon, all new matters alleged in the answer are being controverted already. So, maski walang reply, all matters raised in the answer are being controverted already. If you talk... In relation to decision in payment, the answer is yes, because the debtor would offer another thing. Uh, example, if the thing to be delivered is a sum of money like 20000 the debtor instead would offer his carabao in payment of his debt and therefore the consent of the creditors is absolutely necessary. Okay? He may not want the carabao. Okay? But uh, uh, in application of payments, is the consent of the creditor required? Definitely, there is no question he because he would accept. Okay, uh, then there is consent. However, okay, the question that would uh, have to be answered is to which debt the payment should be applied. The third. Uh, Together we can. Together we can. Together we can.